Hello and welcome back to the Hallian video tutorial series and at the moment we're deep in the bowels of the Wavetable synthesizer. In the last episode, I'll stick a link somewhere for you to go and check it out, uh, we, we introduced uh, the concept of standard stock and um, basic waveforms being added together into a table and then we can morph between those waves to get some um, interesting sounds. But we're not restricted to um, stock waves by any stretch of the imagination. First thing that we're going to do is I'm going to delete the entire program, throw the whole thing away and start with a completely clean slate so that we're not confused with any of the stuff that was left over from the previous time. Instead of creating a new wave this way and adding one of the stock waves in, instead we're going to drop this little box down that says select preset. Each one of these presets is going to give you a set of waves with which to play. So let's have a listen to this one, pristine, see what that sounds like. Now we're starting to get to that territory where we can hear interesting waves morphing between each other if we turn that into alt. that's just our starting position you know we're not restricted in any way to what we're given out of the box if we select all of these segments we can make them bigger we can edit the crossfades we can edit the distance that it the time that it spends playing each sample So this is a very big bank of stock presets, absolutely vast, just goes on and on forever. And each one of these waves, don't forget, they are completely editable in their own right. As we drill further and further into the wavetable synthesizer, you're going to see that you know nothing is fixed in stone. Let's have a look at this wave here, just by way of example. If I just press the key on the keyboard, it's scanning through all of those waves. 17 of them. But if I solo, now it's just going to play this wave. If I turn the oscilloscope back on, and freeze that, there's the period of the wave, and that is that. We saw it with the sine wave earlier, but it doesn't matter. Every single wave, it's just a wave. It's being repeated 260 times a second because I'm pressing C3, and that's the shape of the wave. That is exactly this. This, this isn't some like virtual imaginary representation. That is the actual wave. Now, the presets are great. And once you've built wavetables, you can save them yourself using the preset editor. But where things really get interesting with wavetables is when we start importing our own samples. So let's have a look at how that's, uh, how that's accomplished. It's incredibly easy. I open the media bay. Okay, that's the sound we're going to import into our wavetable. Pick it up. What we want to do is we want to take a load of photographs of this wave to try to accurately represent it and we do it by selecting this number of markers here. You can have up to 256 of them. So let's go for it. Now then, let's see what it sounds like. Well that's quite high, that's quite dull and thuddy. Why? Well, because I'm playing C3. When we generated those 256 markers, it's completely arbitrary depending on how long the wave is. But when I press a C3, it's basically playing 260 waves a second. So there's no correlation between the key that I'm playing and the sample. 
but we can ask it to tell us what we think the pitch of this sample is. There's a little bit of tone in there. If we look at this uh, tuning fork down here, it generates this red line and if we hover over it, Hallian thinks this is a D-sharp 5. Now I'm playing a C3 here. So let's try playing a D-sharp 5 and see what we get. Original sample. Me. Really not bad now. So but just by taking 256 snapshots, don't forget normal sampling rate, 44, 48 kilohertz, 40,000, 48,000 uh, samples a second. Now we've got 256 snapshots for the entire sound. And it's doing an okay job of actually representing that. But we didn't drag a percussion sound into the wavetable editor to try to replicate a percussion sound. We would have used the sampler for that. Let's get interesting. Let's start playing with these sounds. First things first, let's try to more accurately represent the sound that we can see that we have. Because this has taken 256 identical snapshots throughout the sound, but we can see that the vast majority of the interest is at the beginning. Well, we have an option just for that. Because if we set exponential setting, you can see now it clusters the markers towards the beginning of the sample in an exponential manner. And we'll get a higher quality reproduction of the sound because we know that we're, we're dealing with a transient heavy sound. Let's double the length of time it spends playing every one of those segments. Do it again. Now we're starting to get some kind of tonal synth based effect out of it. Let's see what it sounds like. That's pretty cool. Double it again. Notice that every time I double this, so I'm now just playing C, D, E, F, G. It's always playing pitched. So it's taking each one of these waves, which has a characteristic and a nature to it, but it's still playing it when I play C 260 times a second. We're still getting a C. And this is the weird thing about wavetable synthesis, that it decouples your the tone from your original sound and makes it entirely based on the key that you play. And now that the, sam the sample that we started with is only suggesting a colour for how the sound is going to be represented. And when we first imported it and we had a, a, a very small sample that it was able to pretty accurately replicate and we played the right note on the keyboard, it sounded like the original uh, source recording because we'd taken enough snapshots to, to get that reproduction. But now we've started stretching it out and we're spending longer playing each one of these waves. We've thrown away that original characteristic of the sound. And we've got a synthesizer. This is now a synthesizer. For the sake of convenience of the demonstration to bring the numbers back down into some kind of usable limits, I'm going to reduce the number of markers down to 20. Because we're no longer particularly interested in reproducing the percussion sound, we proved that we could, but that's not really where we're at. And so the number of um, markers that we have is really up to us. It's a, it's, a, it's a subjective question. Of course, we're playing far fewer samples, so it's over in a much shorter period of time. Let's stretch them out. And you can hear the tail really fading away there. We can actually make each one of these waves normalized by selecting the normalized wave. So now every single wave in the table is normalized and this is going to have a dramatic effect on the sound. So ordinarily where you would have that tail as the as the sound fades away. We, we don't have that now. Everything is being played at maximum volume.
The other option available to us in normalization is wave is normalized sequence, and that means that the the loudest wave in the sequence is used as a normalization target. But in this case, the loudest wave was pretty close to zero anyway. So when we normalize sequence, we make it as loud as we can without damaging the integrity or the the, the relationship between the volumes within the entire sequence. By default, uh, Hallian uh, aligns the phase of the waves such that they all match up. If you see the end of one wave, it ties into the next and you always get, it will do a very, very good job of tying all of these things together, which means that you get very few artifacts in the sound that you play back. That's because of this align phases feature. If we decouple that and say, keep the original phase, now those random 20 photographs, those snapshots that we took of the sound are completely decoupled. Look, this one happened to be right at the top of its period. And then when we switch to the next photograph down here, I call them photographs because it's a good visualization technique to say it's literally just snapshots of sound. This one happens to be right at the bottom and that's going to introduce those artifacts into the sound and it will sound completely different. And you can hear that stutter. Now that, that might be an effect you want, in which case, you know, that's how to find it. But a line phase gives you a much smoother effect. Once again, just to prove that all of this is still just waves, solo it, turn the spectrum analyzer on, and that is that. Each one of these waves is exactly as pictured. What other options have we got? Spectral analyzes the frequency of the tone and tries to find significant differences in the spectral quality of the sample. And spectral voice is a pitch based spectral analysis. This is a percussion sound, so we're not going to get much use out of those. Exponential is definitely the one to go, the one to go with for this. Now, everything that we've done up until now has been dealing with a single sample, but we don't, we're not restricted to a single sample. We can have as many as we want. If I bring this down to, let's say, 10. So these first 10 markers here are all for this percussion sample. And if we click on any of them, we see this VST sound, D sharp 5, V2.wav. It will say that for them all. Let's go back to my media bay. I'm going to pick this up. I'm going to drag it down into the wavetable. And you see the little the red line at the end? I'm going to drop it there. That is now our car door. Of course, at the moment, this is just a single wave. So when I play that single wave, it doesn't sound anything like a car door because it's literally a single wave. Freeze it, and that is the same thing as that. It's a stereo sample, as you can see, but there's the left-hand side, there's the right-hand side, and there's the composite. Here's the sharp peak, there's the sharp peak, down into a trough, back up, ziggle around a bit, another mini peak, which is here, down to the trough, and then up again. That is a single complex wave. Of course, we don't want a single complex wave. We want some kind of representation of this card or sample. So let's not get too carried away. We'll just have 10 markers for this one as well. And there they are. So now, when we select any of these samples over here, we see Cardor 01, and on these samples over here, Lock D sharp 5 B2. We have 20 uh, waves in total in our table. And now when we play the, play the note, we get the percussion bit and the Cardor bit.
because we're in normalization mode here, everything that we do to this wavetable, every edit we make, will always make sure that the playback is normalized. It's not doing anything fundamental to any, any of the audio underneath. It's just ensuring, it's like a playback um, feature really. It's not something that you have to apply. We're just in normalized sequence mode. Go to normalized wave mode. And now every one of these will be maximized. Can you see that uh, entry number 10 in the original wave was actually empty and there's nothing for it to, to normalize? So let's take that one away. We're not restricted in any way to what we can do with these uh, waves. We can, it's entirely up to us. If I wanna pick this one up and move it over here, I am absolutely entitled to do so. <laughs> In the next episode, we'll start examining each one of these individual waves and see how we can edit it inside the Spectrum Editor. I hope you'll join me then. Thanks very much for watching.